So welcome back to plenary number five already. Uh, cette séance plénière s'appelle Ne laissez personne pour compte, un programme inclusif pour l'après 2020. So allow me to introduce our two speakers now. Uh, Khalil Sharif, who is Chief Executive Officer at the Aga Khan Foundation Canada. He cultivated his interest in international development and conflict resolution issues through a variety of activities, including Harvard Negotiation Law Review, Harvard Program on Humanitarian Policy and Conflict Research, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, etc. Also, he was the youngest member ever elected as a school trustee in 1993 for the Board of School Trustees in Richmond, BC. Say that, that deserves applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good, I like your enthusiasm. Um, Cicely McWilliam, child rights advocate and outgoing co-chair, Can Watch Stakeholder Engagement and Policy Working Group. For more than eight years, she worked at Save the Children, working across the global policy landscape with colleagues from health, humanitarian, child protection, and child poverty. In addition to her role with the Policy Working Group for the Canadian Partnership Women and Children's Health, she also co-chaired the International Child Protection Network of Canada Policy Group. Ms. McWilliam has worked with governments, civil society, and corporations to develop policy and practice aimed at securing the rights of children to health, education, protection, and opportunity. That also deserves a round of applause. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, so I'm actually sort of kicking us off here, uh, and um, uh, Kilil and I were talking earlier today um, about sort of, uh, this is a short panel. It's uh, not an expert in that sense, or a panel, it's not going to be a tech uh, or a, a, you know, technology or a, what's the word I'm looking Technical. for? Technical. Technical, that's where I'm looking for, a technical kind of panel. We want to take it up 30,000 feet or so. Um, and we want to sort of uh, frame some of the conversations that will be happening this afternoon um, and maybe put some challenging ideas in the room about what needs to happen uh, for us to, as the conference title suggests, go beyond 2020 in terms of uh, women's, women and children's health. So um, I'm going to start off by saying that uh, the, what I'm going to be talking about, uh, which is universal health coverage and why it's important, um, really comes out of uh, a lifetime of work. Uh, before working at Save the Children, uh, I was um, uh, an advocate for LGBTQI rights, um, and I was involved in politics here in Canada. And the thing that, um, and I worked for the party that brought universal health coverage to Canada. So uh, universal health coverage is a very important uh, sort of foundational element for me personally. Uh, but what I'd like to say to or, or talk about or have this group think about is why universal health coverage is absolutely crucial for what we do and what we hope to achieve. Um, but before I do that, I want to kind of get a sense check the room a little bit, knowing who's in the room and what you're, you're doing. So this is an easy question, I think. How many people here believe that every woman, every child, every adolescent, every man has a fundamental right to health? There you go. I, pretty, I was pretty sure it was going to be unanimous. The combination of a lot of Canadians and the, the, the topic at the, the conference thought left me with that, feeling pretty confident about that. But I'm not as confident about some of the other questions that I'm going to ask you to think about today. Um, but before I get to those questions, I do want to say there's a, there's, um, there's a reason why universal health coverage has become very much a topic of focus um, f in the global conversation, right? Um, I come at it, as do many, from the point of view of a rights-based approach. Everybody has a right. 
But there are other reasons why universal health coverage is also really important, right? There are economic reasons why the World Bank, perhaps for some of us who are in our 50s, would have been surprised 20 years ago that the World Bank would make universal health coverage its primary focus. <laughs> um, uh, but um, as well as, of course, the WHO and others, um, because it is uh, so key to um, reducing poverty. And why is that? Well, because out-of-pocket expenses for health um, is one of the leading reasons why we have extreme poverty in the world, right? A hundred million people um, go into extreme poverty annually because of out-of-pocket health expenses. An additional 800 million people uh, uh, spend more than 10% of their household income on health expenses. When you're spending money on health expenses, what are you not spending money on? You're not spending money maybe on shelter or food or education for your children, although education should also be a public service, let me just say right here and right now. Um, so all of those things uh, are the economic argument, right? So it's not an insignificant one, but it's not the one that I'm going to focus on here necessarily. It's, it's the rights-based one. So then the next question I have, how many organizations who do implementation of health projects advocate either as part of their projects or separate from their projects for universal health coverage in the countries where they work? So you see, a lot fewer hands went up there. So then the question I would have is another question. Of the projects, that you know that you're working on right now. How many of your projects reach 50,000 people, let's say women or children, uh, f that one project reached 50,000? Hands up. 100,000? 200,000? 500,000? A million? So even if all of us had all of our projects in one country, we would not be able to deliver universal health coverage. So when we in this, world, in this room are not working on achieving universal health coverage, are we fulfilling our mission vision as organizations, as individuals who believe that the right to health is foundational? And this isn't to say, I fully, I come from Save the Children for eight years. I fully endorse and believe that the work that's being done by the organizations in this room is vital and is life-saving and health-promoting. So I'm not saying that the, that shouldn't be done. But the question is, as you're doing that, how are you, as individuals, as organizations, working to build the right system so that everyone has access so that there is health for all, and particularly for the most excluded. Um, so then the other sort of uh, question that I would then sort of, you know, leads us to, to think about a little bit um, is this idea of exclusion, obviously. This is sort of what this panel, there, this particular panel was talking about. Um, and then, it, you know, if ultimately the duty bearer, let me start there, the duty bearer for health should never be a charity. We're not, in fact, we're not the duty bearer for health. The duty bearer for health is the national government, right? They are the duty bearer to all rights and to the right to health in this case. And the financing for health should never be 100% based on charity because we can never guarantee that. So the only way for us to ensure that uh, health is available to all is for us to assist both as organizations and our government, countries, national governments, to develop the systems um, to and that is not just, the not just the delivery systems, but the financing systems to be able to achieve universal health coverage. And so those systems, that's why it's important, and, and a lot of folks probably in this room 
haven't had a conversation today about national tax systems, for example. But that is the kind of conversation that has to take place, right? We have to talk about where does the money come from? And ODA is a piece of it and will be a piece of it probably for longer than many donor governments would like for countries that are fragile, for conflict affected countries, for countries with weak governance basically. But for countries that have stronger governance that are, are moving from being low income to middle income countries, they're gonna need to transition away from ODA. They need to develop their own systems to finance their own, uh, the, 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 develop the financial systems to, fi to, to finance their health systems. So that's where platforms like the GFF, the Global Financing Facility, are quite useful in my mind, is at that particular moment. Um, but we also have to have conversations around and, and our organizations, and maybe not the people in this room who are health focused and specific, but the advocacy people in your, in your organizations need to be talking about, thinking about um, those, those financing systems at country level. And they need to be talking about ending corruption so that the leakage between the federal you know, treasury to the clinic on the ground no longer occurs. If you talk to my colleague, Dave, Dr. David Oyembe in Nigeria, every single time we had a Save the Children conversation, uh, about uh, advocacy and health, and he would say, what are we going to say about corruption? Because that's killing the, that's killing the sector in Nigeria. Um, the other thing that they need to talk about is a progressive taxation system. You know, a lot of, there's lots of talk about sin tax and other sort of targeted tax schemes, and those are great, again, for uh, like complementary and adding money into the system, but, but those, are, uh, those can be regressive tax positions for the poor as well. So even though I'm not gonna say you should never do uh, a targeted tax like, like a sin tax, it shouldn't be what you base your, your system on, a progressive income tax system that taxes individuals and corporations fairly based on what they make is what's needed. It's what fuels our system here. It's, it makes sense. Um, and then the other thing that we need to think about when we think about exclusion um, beyond just sort of exclusion based on, uh, you know, poverty, which is, is a big exclusion in terms of health, there are other kinds of exclusion in the health system, right? There's exclusion because of religion and race and gender and sexuality. Um, so these, and, and sexual identity. So these are all things that also have to be discussed. Um, and we don't, we're not very good uh, when, or my experience in eight years um, is with, this, with the um, international development sector is that we're not really good at talking about, we're, uh, about all kinds of exclusion. We're, we've become better at talking about gender, but we're not very good at talking about race. And I think in, in particular, we're not very good about talking about race because we then have to acknowledge very publicly that the international development sector is based on very much on a colonial model. Um, and, and we're not comfortable talking about that. We're not talking about how colonial models continue to be replicated in international development. Um, and so, you know, but we need to get past that if we're gonna actually make real change at country level. Um, so I think, I'm trying to think if I, there was anything else. Those were, the, those were the key, these were the big sort of things that I wanted to raise, the problematic things that we don't think about or talk about, um, particularly when we're very focused on, you know, getting the funding for the pro health program that we know are, is going to reach 50,000 kids or 100,000 kids or women, and that we really want, um, and we, we know that those communities that we work with need, right? Um, and so we kind of don't take the time sometimes to think about these bigger framing questions and some of the, the, the advocacy work that's required for real change that is sustainable change to occur. Um, so there are five things that um, I think that I want to leave or my takeaway key messages. So 
and I, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget one. So the first is, as you can probably tell, never lose sight of the big picture. Never lose sight when you're thinking and building your projects about what we hope to achieve, which is healthcare for all, right? Start there and have that be your North Star, um, and that will very much change how you think about developing your programs. Um, I think the other thing that we need to think about is obviously, as a former, as an advocate, I very much believe that advocacy needs to play a bigger role in everything we do, um, and that the funding for advocacy needs to increase in all of our organizations, and we need to push donors to better fund advocacy, right? If if the Canadian government would, wants to see sustainable change at country level, they need to fund advocacy at country level. And they need to fund even INGOs to help support that advocacy change. It needs to be direct to country level funding, but there, there is a role for INGOs that have 100 years of experience like Save the Children does to be able to support that work, right? Particularly with children. Um, where there aren't always platforms in country for a child's voice to emerge. And that therefore they need to be created. Um, the private sector certainly has a role to play uh, in health, uh, but universality ultimately uh, means that there cannot be a two-tier health system. There cannot be one health system for the rich and one for the poor. That is not universality. And so again, if we really believe in universality, I would say that you need to build a system that doesn't create two tiers. Um, I mentioned beyond affordability, there are the other exclusions that need to be addressed. Um, and finally, uh, what I said before is don't forget the financing because you will, uh, in the 70s, lots of promises were made by developing countries around creating universal health coverage. Um, and they, they were heartfelt. I mean, I think everybody would say when, you make a, when a politician makes a promise like that, it's not because they, they don't wish it to happen. But wishing <laughs> doesn't get us there. You need to actually do the hard slog uh, on, on the not so fun pieces like, like tax to be able to, to have the, the, the funding to do this kind of work. Um, and you need to make the hard choices as a politician and also in terms of whether you're going to you know, fund that, that fuel subsidy that you know, people may like versus um, you know, implementing a tax uh, that someone might not like, right? So it's, it, to build that will, um, you need to ensure that there is a demand for change at the, at the country level, which is why supporting grassroots advocacy, getting the constituents of those politicians to say, this is what we want, and we will support you if we get it, is super critical. Um, and so those are the things that I would, I would leave you to think about um, and to hopefully include in your uh, discussions uh, as the day goes on. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great, uh, a great delight to be here. This is not my first uh, CanWatch uh, conference, but I never get invited back. Uh, uh, so it's a real delight uh, to be here. So thank you, Helen and team, for, um, for doing that. Um, in the category of everything I learned, I learned from my six-year-old daughter. Uh, we were in the car a few months ago, and uh, as those of you with young children know, everything insightful happens while you're in the car and can't see each other, right? Um, and um, uh, we're driving along, and she says to me, um, Daddy, um, uh, what happens if there is a fire at the fire station? <laughs> hmm. So I said, uh, darling, I, I suppose um, one of the other fire stations would come and help. She said, hmm. silence. A few minutes later, Daddy, yes? What happens if there's a fire at all the fire stations? <laughs> hmm. That would be a problem, darling. She said, hmm, that would be a problem. It sometimes feels like we're uh, operating in uh, contexts where all of our fire stations are on fire, that the issues we're dealing with outstrip 
so much of our collective capacity to deal with those issues. And what I wanted to talk about a little bit today as we think about beyond 2020 uh, and how we reach to our next horizon of inclusion um, is to talk a bit about what you do when all your fire stations are on fire, when you're, everything you have is not quite enough to kind of get to the, last, to the last set of goals. And what I want to suggest is five pivots we might make as we think about uh, the future agenda. Um, uh, these are all caricatures. That is to say, I'm going to talk about five from twos. Um, none of the froms are exactly right, and none of the twos are exactly right, but I think they are enough to get a discussion going for the rest of the day as we move into the, uh, uh, the groups that are going to be discussing a number of dimensions of marginalization and inclusion. So here's my, here's my list. Um, number one, um, we need to move from a focus on health care and health services to a focus on health and quality of life more broadly. Uh, we all know, we all know that the threats to health and the opportunities for health lurk in all kinds of strange and wonderful places, often far removed in time, in place, and in mindset from actual health systems. And the SDGs indeed are a call, right, for us to think about things at a completely different level of aggregation. What is it that a successful society exhibits? And how is it that a commitment to health rather than health care might change that view of things? Uh, uh, dear uh, Bob Evans at UBC once wrote an extraordinary article called Health Care as a Threat to Health, right? That health care and health services can consume so much resource and attention that we forget what are the broad things that actually will drive improvements to health, agriculture, food systems, infrastructure, um, uh, both for energy and for access, um, fiscal policy, tax policy, as uh, uh, Saisi has already talked about, um, uh, governance, uh, advanced education, research, um, the entire set of things that we need for health. So number one, pivot from looking at health care and health services to uh, reminding ourselves about the broader view of health and quality of life and what that requires. Pivot two, we move from innovative finance to what I'm calling necessary and appropriate finance. Uh, the institution in which I'm involved, the Aga Khan Development Network, have, have, we use all kinds of different financial tools. Um, we use the old stuff, the money you don't have to give back, the new stuff, money that you do have to give back um, uh, in some way or another. And they all have their roles. But there is a lot of focus these days on the so-called innovative finance part of this, which is the money you have to give back some way or another. And the question I want to pose is that I'm not sure that that a uh, set of financial tools is well suited to a goal of uh, kind of reaching the most marginalized. And so what we need is not a focus on innovative finance. What we need is an understanding of all the financial tools at our disposal at a pretty granular level and to be able to understand what each of these methods of finance is good for and what it's not good for. Money you need to give back might work in certain health settings, dense urban areas where there's a middle class ready to pay for health. But in most of the areas where we're now trying to reach, it's actually not a very good solution at all. So we need to move from innovative finance to a focus on the portfolio of necessary and appropriate finance. Uh, pivot three, we need to move from a focus on point innovations to locally rooted innovation ecologies. We've learned a lot about innovation over the last 25 years. And one of the most important things we have learned, looking at everything from Silicon Valley to sites in the developing world, is that we used to think that innovation was actually a product of siloed or atomistic individual geniuses at play, maybe even a little bit more intelligently, an individual organization that was particularly innovative. We now know that innovation is an emergent property of a network of knowledge, financial, and practical institutions that are in a constant conversation with each other, rooted in a particular context. That's the engine of innovation. We have an epidemic of point innovations that are unable to be scaled up. But rather than pushing scale up of point innovations, what we need to do is rethink how it is that we're going to support a network of permanent institutions who are dedicated to innovating in their context for the problems that they, that they, they confront and that they need to deal with. So pivot number three, moving from a focus on point innovations to locally rooted innovation ecologies and to invest in the set of institutions in the countries where we work that are going to be the engines of innovation into the future. Fourth, pivot. We need to move from projects and programs 
to thinking about permanent institutions and systems. Saisi's talked about policy. I couldn't agree more. We also heard in the last panel about the issue of policy engagement. This is something different than policy. This is something different than doing something in a place and then telling the national government to put it into, on a piece of paper. The kinds of performance that we are talking about here, that we are expecting societies to be able to achieve, is not performance that is achieved and then is done with. You know, eradicating polio is a point in time accomplishment. Once you've done it, you can, you can go to other things. Reducing child mortality, you achieve a certain level and then you need to achieve it like every day thereafter. These are requirements for permanent ongoing performance. And permanent ongoing performance requires permanent institutions. And so, uh, partly, the pivot here is to make sure that uh, although development finance, the nature of development funding, forces all of us to think in terms of time-limited, results-focused projects, that the actual context in which we work will not achieve permanent ongoing performance from simply thinking about things in time-limited, results-focused projects. What we need is an institutional vision an institutional vision that talks about what are the permanent set of institutions in the institutional landscape or the places where we are working that are going to underwrite indefinitely the performance that we're talking about. And, and this may be a point of divergence with, with Sisley, which is that I actually think we need to de-theologize the whole question of the nature of those institutions, uh, that we have to be ruthlessly pragmatic, and that we have to accept a level of institutional pluralism of local, regional, national, global institutions, as well as institutions in government, in um, the not-for-profit sector, and in the commercial sector. That this is going to be a cause and a requirement for all these institutions to be working together. And that our view of what the system looks like might be radically different from country to country and from context to context. And I think we have to be very open to that. In fact, nurture a level of institutional experimentation in order to achieve these very, very ambitious goals. So. Pivot number four, move from projects and programs to a focus on permanent institutions and systems. My final pivot, we need to uh, pivot from best guesses based on averages to disaggregated granular data on who actually is being left behind. So we don't know very much, it turns out. Um, I mean, we know a lot and we don't know very much. So much of the kinds of exclusion that we're now worried about are hidden by uh, average aggregated data. Uh, I think those of us who are involved in this work on the ground understand that in a place like Afghanistan, uh, the challenges of exclusion are different from province to province, from district to district within a province, from valley to valley. That the nature of exclusion, the nature of marginalization is itself not homogeneous. We have highly variegated forms of exclusion and marginalization across all the parts of the world where we are working. And our data sets simply do not shed light on them. In fact, sometimes they're part of the problem. This is a big, big issue because, as Saisi reminded me earlier today, there are reasons that the excluded are excluded. And there are very vested interests why those people who are excluded ought not be counted. So there is some of, 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 of this, which is simply better technology will allow us to, uh, to do things, and we need to experiment far, far more broadly with different ways of identifying and gathering data from even the remote, remote parts of the world. But part of this is a political will to include everyone in our policy view and our vision. But we need this because without it, we're not going to be able to measure progress, and we're not going to be able to actually know who is being left behind. So pivot number five from best guesses um, based on averages to disaggregated granular data on actually who is being left behind. If it's true, if it's true that our, all of our fire stations are on fire, we need to pivot to looking for other kinds of resources. Those are pivots in program strategy, they are pivots in field of vision, and they are pivots in mindset. And uh, partly what I'm hoping you might do uh, for the rest of the afternoon in the uh, series of sessions that have been outlined as you think about the issues of marginalization on the next horizon is make sure that we're not being imprisoned by our experience to date, but that our experience to date is a trampoline moving us into new sets of views on what we might do to achieve our ambitious goals beyond 2020. Thank you.
Well, thank you both for those very engaging remarks that are going to bring us into more discussions this afternoon.